see some acts, facts that are there, just like last week. The facts that are printed out there are things that we're going to highlight during the preaching, but the first of them, you'll notice, is blank, and that's intentional. This is the part that you fill in the blank about, and you say, what do I write there? You write a summation of what our scripture reader is going to share. You see, there's things I'm going to share about during the preaching, but each week during this uh, series, we're going to have someone read the scripture text and then share, perhaps for about five minutes, some things that are insights or applications into the Word of God. This week we have Brandon Smith sharing with us, and I think we'll have Brandon and a microphone come on forward here. And if you would do this with me, why don't you take your Bibles right now, and we'll all of us turn to Acts chapter 2. If somebody is in need of a Bible, you can get a hand up, and uh, we've got a Bible we can hand to you so that you can follow along with the text. It's Acts chapter 2 we'll be looking at, and it's... Um, it's a relatively dramatic chapter. It's a, a little bit long, too, so um, you sure to give your good attention. Follow all the way through. Brandon's going to read the entire text, and then he's got some comments for us, and you can take note of what those are in your Acts Facts page, and then following that, we'll have the preaching from God's Word. Once again, it's Acts chapter 2, and we'll start at verse 1. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there was staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own, our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions. Your old men will, will dream dreams, even on my servants, both men and women. I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is, my right, he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known, you have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, 
that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of, of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted this message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonder, wonders and miracles Miraculous signs were done by the, apostle, by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So that's a beautiful scripture, and it's a, it's a rich text, like Pastor Paul said to me, and I agree. Um, I just wanted to recap it and kind of touch on a few things. So the apostles were there were with others, um, and there was a great rushing of winds and a, and a commotion and things like that. And um, the Holy Spirit came upon them. Tongues of fire came and rested on them. And they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And... Uh, so in all this commotion and, and the noise, uh, the, the Jews and the elders and the devout men in Jerusalem came to see what was going on, and then they, they witnessed the people um, speaking in tongues. And some said, wow, some were, knew it was serious. Man, what does this mean, they said. And others said they've, you know, they mocked and said they've had too much wine, they're drunk, things like that. Um, and at that point, Peter, you know, this is the important, uh, this is, well, it's all important, but this is what I'd like to kind of touch on. Peter stood up and preached a sermon, and he quoted scripture, prophecy, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the people there, the people were, uh, they were convicted. Their, their heart, it said, uh, in the English Standard Version, it says they were cut to their hearts. They felt conviction in their heart, and, and that's important for this evangelism. They felt conviction in their heart, and then they asked that question that we all want, want to be asked. What do we do? They asked the brothers, what do we do? because they, they, they knew this was true. And Peter replied, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and receive the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and with further uh, exhortation and instruction, they did. And the number that were, that were saved that day was 3,000. Amen for that. And this is just incredible because this really happened. I mean, could you imagine being there and being one of these 3,000 or being a spectator um, and witnessing this. It's an incredible thing. Um, and, and Peter also, in the midst of all this, let them know um, this promise is for you, for your children, for all people far and wide, all who God calls to him, to himself. So Peter kind of turns it back to God saying, this, this is the power of God. This isn't me standing up preaching a sermon and you feeling this is the conviction. He's, be, he's led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. And... Um, the power is from God. So amen for that. We can see that design for evangelism. There was a preaching led by the Holy Spirit using scripture and the gospel. There was a conviction in the heart of the people. There was a repentance, a baptism, and then a receiving of the Holy Spirit. And then further exhortation and instruction to get these people to where they need to be. Uh, so that's our design that we have that's coming straight from scripture. And the other thing that I'd like to touch on is just, I won't go uh, too deep into it, um, but Acts 2, 
verse 42 through 47, the end paragraph here in the chapter, and it describes the fellowship and the community of believers um, that came from this and how they interacted with each other, how they treated each other, and how they lived. And um, the closest that I've come to experiencing that is Hope Community Church. And it's very, to, to me, it's very similar to this text here. And I'm just so grateful that uh, the Lord blessed me with being a part of this church. So, amen for all that. Thank you. Brandon, thank you. Pray briefly, and then we'll go right into the teaching from the Word of God. We pray, Lord, that you would open our ears to hear not only the words that are spoken, but what it is that your Spirit is doing beneath those words to communicate to our hearts. We pray that there would be an ability that I have to communicate this, and for us as a group and throughout this whole room to have a kind of a peace that would fall on this room where we were able to focus uniquely on you and what you would communicate to us today. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Sunday, we began a new sermon series. It was a study of the action-packed book of Acts. In chapter 1, and we're going to just review for a moment, in chapter 1, Jesus said to his disciples, don't leave Jerusalem, stay here. Wait until I give you this gift of the Holy Spirit, and once the Holy Spirit arrives, then you will be able to take the message of the gospel to people in all various lands. You will have an accompanying power to do this. So this band of believers, this little group of folks, waited and prayed and waited and prayed for 10 days. Then came a Sunday morning a day called Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus had died and risen again. And on that day, the Holy Spirit came, the church was born, and the world has never been the same since. And that's what we are going to be discussing today. We're going to hear about the day of Pentecost and what happened on that day and the significance of all of what took place that day. We start with the day of Pentecost. This day of Pentecost came, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came. Some of you say, what is Pentecost? The name Pentecost, penta meaning 50, it's 50 days after Passover, and as a result, it's 50 days after Jesus died and rose again. It was for the Jewish people, Pentecost was a religious holiday for them. It was a time for worship. I'll tell you why. In Israel, there are two harvest seasons. They have a growing season in the late winter and through the spring. And at the end of the spring, before the heat of summer, they have a harvest. And still later, after the summer, they plant again. And all through the fall and up until the early winter, they grow again. So the first harvest at the first part of the year is one where they bring in their first fruits. And when the first fruits come in and they've got something to show for it, they would say, we want to get together and want to worship God and give him offerings of what he's given us. It was for them something, something a little like our Thanksgiving. Do you understand? Many people would come from great distances to be worshiping God at that occasion. So there were people from all around the world, Jewish people, and some who were Gentiles who had become followers of Judaism, who had gathered together. And that day of Pentecost came. Now, meanwhile, our friends, the believers, are still watching and praying and praying and waiting. They're doing all these things. The day of Pentecost came. They were all together in one place, that is, the believers were. And suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. This violent wind, you're not going to think of as being a breeze. You're not going to think of it as even being something that seems kind of, um, you know, kind of like a wind for flying kites. We're talking about something like a tornado. We're talking about something like a jet engine. We're talking about a great sound filled the room, filled the neighborhood. People came running from all directions. As you know, Peter's going to stand up in front of thousands of people soon. Why are they all gathering? God has called their attention because there is this great sound. I've got a list of some of the things that happened. There was a sound, the blowing of a violent wind. There was a sight that follows as well. 
they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Not only was there all this sound, but there was this fireball from heaven that comes, and then that fireball begins to separate into lots and lots and lots of little pieces, and it, these pieces separate and form just over the heads of the various ones who were believers. And, it tells in verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. They began to speak in these other tongues, other languages that they'd never learned. They were all from Galilee, and so it would be as if here we all are, and suddenly we begin to speak in languages that none of us have studied or known. What is happening here? As it says in verse 4, this is all the result of being filled with the Holy Spirit. I've got a designation about some of this here. I thought I had a picture, but I guess I don't. Okay. Speaking in tongues, somebody is going to say to me, I've heard of this phenomenon. What is this exactly? We'll say a few words about it. In this instance, what's described is speaking a known language that you did not learn. In verse 11, the people, and you can read this a little further down the text, the people who gather say, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. As we're going to note, these people have come from all over the world. Some of them come from Africa, some have come from Asia, some have come from Europe. They've taken a long trip. All of them have gotten together now in Jerusalem, and most of them only at best knew Hebrew as a second language. Most of them had their own language that they principally spoke, and now all of a sudden they are hearing in their own languages the wonders of who God is. And so in this instance, this is what is going on. There have been times, and I've read of such things, maybe you have too, a missionary goes to some other culture, in fact a missionary goes into some tribal area, and maybe even goes to a more distant tribal area where he's never met anybody, and some emergency arises, and he talks to somebody there, and they work something out, and there's some great thing that happens as a result of it all, and later people say, well, how did you talk to that guy? Well, I just spoke to him and he answered me. But how did you understand each other? Well, I spoke in English, he understood me. He's never heard English before. And they talked to the guy, the native guy. Well, what I, well, I just spoke in my own language, whatever my own language was, and he spoke right back to me. And that it's like, uh, the, the missionary doesn't know that language. Now, there are odd occasions when things like this have happened miraculously. I don't know that you can depend on that always happening. I'd like to if I were going to other places, just there it is. You know, that'd be fun. But God has done this before. But there's another description of tongues that we get when the Apostle Paul speaks of this. And I see something here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 2. It's on the screen. Paul speaks of tongues. He says, For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. Now, Paul is describing an unknown language used for speaking to God. He says, if you spoke in this language, people wouldn't understand you, but you might speak to God this way. Paul, in fact, in the same chapter says that he speaks in such tongues often. He finds that this is something that helps him to communicate with God, and in prayer he does this often. But he says, I don't do that when I'm with others. They wouldn't know what I was saying. And so this isn't a time for that unless there is an interpretation of such tongues. So we have at least a couple of varieties of tongues. Someone might be practical enough to ask, oh, what use are tongues? What use is speaking in tongues? It seems fairly obvious that if you're in some missions setting and suddenly for reasons in an emergency situation you're able to communicate with other people, that would be highly useful. I can see that. But someone might say, well, these tongues where it's just between you and God, of what use is that, at least practically, for the rest of the body of Christ? And I would say this. There have been occasions, and you've experienced this, when you are praying about something, and the Spirit of God is moving you to pray about something, and you pray into it, and you pray into it, and you pray into it, and then you get beyond what you even know how to communicate. And the Bible says that people begin to sometimes pray with groans and utterances that go beyond words as the Holy Spirit is praying through you about something. It's something that God is in some manner using in prayer to be on behalf of not just you, but the body of Christ as a whole. If you knew that there were people who were praying for this body of believers, praying for this church, praying for you, praying for your family, 
praying as directed by God, praying in ways that the Spirit of God was moving them to pray, you would probably say, well, that sounds useful. If God is directing people to be praying, that would be a great thing. And in some respects, that's what the Apostle Paul describes about his experience with tongues. It's valuable for a church, especially when it's guided by and phrased by the Holy Spirit of God. Well, we move on. The crowd's reaction to all this, verse 5. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Staying there, when it says staying there, I don't mean permanently, but they'd come from all over the place, and they had arrived there. It was a long trip. It took months and months to get there. They arrived there, <clears throat> and now they're waiting until Pentecost comes. And on Pentecost morning, I think they thought, I'm going to go to the temple and see what's happening there. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> there's this thing that sounds like an engine a jet landing on the street, and they rush over to see what this is, and they see all these people and hear all these people talking, and they say, this is something we've never seen before. It says they came from all over the place. They heard the sound, verse 6. They gathered together in bewilderment. They heard them speaking all in their own individual language. They amazed. They said, aren't these men all Galileans? Aren't the guys who are talking rather untrained men from one specific region? How is it then, verse 8, that each of us hears them in his own native language? And then it lists them all out. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and Mesopotamia and Judea, Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt, parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Cretans, Arabs. Some of you say those are a lot of names. If you look at the map, you're going to see on our map that they're coming from northern Africa. They're coming from Europe. They're coming from areas all around in Arabia and this way, the Middle East. All of them coming from various spots and gathering onto Jerusalem. They've come from everywhere. And as it says in verse 6, they were bewildered. As it says in verse 7, they were amazed. As it says in verse 12, they were amazed and perplexed. They don't know what to make of this. What does this mean is their question in verse 12. We're going to note, and I think that Brandon highlighted this well, some in the crowd formed their own explanation. In verse 13, they said, I know what this is. They have had too much wine. They're probably drunk. That's what this is. Now, I've got to tell you, that phrase, they've had too much wine, is helpful for us in this respect. It tells us something of what the site probably looked like. Let me see if I can unfold this for you. You don't normally think people are drunk if they're speaking a different language. You go to the airport. You go to Detroit Metro Airport. People are going past you, and they're speaking other languages. You don't normally tell you to say, turn to your children and say, let's stay away from them. They're probably drunk. That's not what happens. The fact that they are proclaiming God in other languages isn't the key that they're probably drunk. Instead, sometimes when the Spirit of God comes on people and fills people, and you have seen this, if you've been around with Christians, you've noticed sometimes that somebody is so filled with the Spirit of God that they begin to sort of look radiant, and they look like there's this sort of otherworldly look or joy that comes on them. Have you seen this before? Occasionally it's happened that something beyond that happens where somebody gets caught up to being with God in such a way that there might be trembling or looking overcome physically in some respects. You say, oh, I, I don't know if that happens to you, friends. In writings about revivals, when the Holy Spirit falls on people, these kinds of things are fairly common. I'll give you just one set of examples. This comes from the life and the writings of John Wesley. There he is. Now, John Wesley was no Pentecostal in that sense. He was a Methodist. And at the same time, he would preach Christ, and the Spirit of God would come, and there would be experiences people would have that would cause them to do sometimes unusual things. I'll just read a little bit of this. Here, this is coming from his journal. These are the words of John Wesley. At New Year's, 1739, George Whitfield, my brother Charles, three others and I, with about 60 of our brethren, were present at a love feast in Fetter Lane. He's saying that in London, at a church on Fetter Lane, he and his brother and an evangelist named George Whitfield and a bunch of others got together and they all had what is communion. That's what he's describing as this love feast. They all got together for this. At about three in the morning, this communion service went a long time, at about three in the morning, as we were continuing in prayer, so they've been praying and seeking God, the power of God came upon us so mightily that many cried out in holy joy while others were knocked to the ground. We're talking about 1700s Englishmen who were not known for great emotions. And they're having a prayer meeting. 
and they're seeking God earnestly in prayer, and then some of them begin to go, ah! and cry out, and others are knocked to the ground. Now, if you were there and saw this, you might say, these men are unusual. What have they been doing? Uh, and th th you get where I'm going with this thing, all right? As soon as we were recovered a little from awe and amazement at the presence of God, we broke out in one voice saying, we praise thee, O God. We acknowledge thee to be the Lord. Now, it goes on a little further. He says, Thursday, preaching at Newgate. Now he's at another place. One, then another, and another sunk to the earth. As he's preaching, people start falling to the ground. They dropped on every side as if thunderstruck. People are not just sort of kneeling carefully. They're going, boom, and they're falling down like they were hit by thunder. One of them cried aloud. It's a lady. She starts crying out. We besought God on her behalf, and God turned her heaviness into joy. A second, being in the same agony, another lady fell down and began screaming. We called upon God for her also. He, that is God, spoke peace unto her soul. I'll give a third example. He says, Friday evening, I went to a society at Wapping. A society would be a group of people who get together for scripture and for prayer and so forth. And apparently the place, and I'm not making this up, the place is named Wapping, okay? All right. They, he went to Wapping. Weary in body and faint in spirit. So he's saying he's not even feeling especially charged up that day. He's feeling weary in his body. He's feeling faint in his spirit. After I'd finished preaching and was earnestly inviting all sinners to enter into the holiness, the holiest by this new and living way, he's saying he was just entreating people to be saved. He was saying, you've got Jesus, come. Many of those who had heard began to call upon God with strong cries and tears. Some sank down, having no strength remaining in them. Others trembled and quaked exceedingly. Some were torn with a kind of convulsive motion in every part of their bodies, often so violently that sometimes four or five persons could not hold on to them. I think what I'm trying to portray to you is when the Spirit of God comes on people, there is a power there that sometimes causes people to look like something is happening to them. And I'm not going to tell you I know exactly what was happening to the apostles and their friends here at uh, Pentecost, but whatever was happening was so unusual that it caused others to say, they're speaking in this way, they're expressing something, they're looking different. And some of them said, I'm bewildered, I don't know what we got into these. And others said, I know what this is, they must be drunk. That's what some of them thought. The crowd is amazed by these events. Peter is going to, in a moment, stand up and give his explanation of all of what's happening. And he's going to say this is a fulfillment of prophecy. That gets us into the second part of our message. Then Peter, verse 11, stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. He and the other disciples stand up and say, I'm going to tell you about this. And he addresses the crowd. Here's a picture of Peter and the eleven standing and telling them about it. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. And then he gives some practical evidence of why he knows they're not drunk, and everyone should know it. He says, it's only 9 in the morning. Come on, get real. This is not a time when people are getting drunk in this way. No, it's not that. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he has a lengthy quote from the book of Joel. It's interesting to me that Peter would not have known until just at the moment this happened how it was going to be when the Holy Spirit came, what was going to take place, and then he's suddenly given this gift from the Holy Spirit to stand up and have something on his mind to substantiate what's going on from the Old Testament to say, this is what this is. The Spirit of God is working in and through Peter to be able to express all of this. And he begins to share all of these things, saying, Joel wrote about this hundreds of years before, and he gives a list of some things, starting at verse 17. In the last days, God says, now, the last days, or the later days, or the latter times, let's understand this. He says, we can divide all of human history in this way. In the former times, the previous times, that was before Jesus came, before Jesus died, before Jesus rose again, before salvation was secured through Jesus' death on the cross. Is everyone with me about this? That was the former times, the earlier times. Now we get to the latter times, the last days. In these last days, which began after Jesus died and rose again. He says, it's that time. We're in the last days. And so the, the, uh, the prophet um, Joel had been speaking about the last days and saying that these things would happen. And Peter's saying, we are now in those latter days, the last days. We're on the other side of the cross. This is what's happening. All right? In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. I will pour out my spirit, note, on all people, meaning this. 
If you read through the Old Testament, sometimes it says, as it does in, for example, Samuel's life, as you read through that, it says, in those days, there were very few evidences of the Holy Spirit. There was not much prophecy that came. Nobody heard from God. People could go for a long time where no one was hearing anything of God's voice. And then on occasion, something would break through, and there would be one individual. It might be a king like Saul or David on certain occasions who would receive something from God be able to say, this is God speaking. It might be a prophet who it would say, and this is what it would say, then the Spirit of the Lord spoke to him and he said these things. And so it was even with prophets, occasional this would take place, that the Holy Spirit would come in contact with him. Occasionally there was a priest, and there was this occasional time when there would be something where it would be like, oh yeah, okay, this is something God's doing now. This happened only on occasion and only to a very few people. Do you get this so far? Now it says, in these last days I will pour out my Spirit on all people. By all people, what we understand, and he goes on to qualify this, people of every sort who are trusting in Jesus. That is on young men and old men, young women and old women, on people who are Jews and people who are Gentiles, people who live in this place and people who live in that place, people who live in Peter's day and people who live further down the line. People of all kinds, the Holy Spirit is now available for ordinary, everyday people. This brings us, and we're sort of in the middle of all of these things that Peter's saying, but I want to point out an Acts fact here. And uh, this is something that is on the back of your bulletin as well. Whereas the Holy Spirit had occasionally filled some people in the past. Are you listening? Whereas the Holy Spirit had occasionally filled some people in the past, now the Holy Spirit is available to fill all Christians all the time. It is possible for you to say, I'm going to meet with God today. And you take out your Bible and you pray, God, show me something from your word. And you begin to look at scripture and then you say, God, I want to talk to you about this. And then you have the sense that the Spirit of God is showing you something in his word. The Spirit of God is speaking to you in some manner. The Spirit of God is guiding you in some respect. The Spirit of God is putting something on your heart to be praying into. And you say, that's God. I know that voice. That's the Lord doing this in me. God is meeting with me. The Spirit of God is right here. I don't have to depend on somebody else, a priest or somebody else, to communicate what God says. He's speaking something to me right now. You got this? This is new! As of what Peter is saying right then, he's saying, God told us this would happen. The, Joel said this would happen sometime. We've been waiting for this, and now it's here! It's available. This is cool. Not just for this one here, not just for this one there, but for all of God's people and available at all times for all of God's people. The Holy Spirit has come. Going back to his list of things. In the last days I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. That is, they will receive communication from God. I'm going to focus on the word prophesy. He says your sons and daughters, they will prophesy. They'll receive communication from God. They're going to express it to others. It's not going to be just priests or kings or others who can do this, but all, your sons and your daughters, young men and old, not limited by gender, not limited by any of these things. You will have the Spirit poured out onto you, and they will prophesy. We a moment ago said, what's this business about tongues? Somebody's going to say, well, what is prophecy? I want to make this clear. In this context, we're not talking about creating new scripture. It is true that scripture is prophecy. However, when the Bible speaks throughout the New Testament of God causing people to have words of prophecy, or when it says here, your sons and your daughters will prophesy, this is not a promise from Peter that all of your sons and daughters are going to start writing new scripture. That's not what it's telling you. That's not what he's referring to. You say, well, what is this then? It's I'll say this, nor is it simply another way of saying something about preaching or pastoring. I've had people say to me, oh, I know what prophecy is. It's just somebody, a pastor, standing up, speaking, teaching things, and so on. And I hope that some or much preaching in some respects is a word from God, and in that way becomes something like prophecy. But I wouldn't say the two are co-equal, because there are many, many times when a Christian has a word that comes from God, now, sometimes it's just for himself, and that's not really prophecy because he's not supposed to speak that to others, but sometimes it's a word that God shows him, and God says, I'm moving you. I want you to share this with someone else. You might be sharing it one-on-one -on -one in some private setting. You might be sharing it as the two of you are praying together. It may come out during a prayer meeting or some other setting, and this is not necessarily preaching, but it is a word from God 
that is meant to be shared with another. In this way, prophecy is simply a gift from God, a gift that God gives to Christians, allowing them to hear his voice, and then, when appropriate, to communicate that message to others. You might say, is that useful for a church? Friends, I should say, it is. When I've gotten together with other Christians, and I've said, here is something that is a key decision for our church. Here's a key decision in my life. Here's something where I need God's guidance about this. And I say, will you pray with me about this? And we pray it through. And somebody finally says, as we were praying, I was sensing very clearly the Lord was saying, this may be the answer to this. And then two or three others say, I agree with that. That seems really what God is doing here. I would say that's highly important to me. Does that make sense? There is an ability to be hearing something from the Lord and to be able to then even communicate. I think this may be what God is saying. What does the Apostle Paul say concerning prophecy? He says, for example, in 1 Corinthians 14, that such prophecy can build up a church with encouragement and with guidance. It can reveal God's perspective. It should be weighed and tested so you're not just taking it um, without testing it out but it shouldn't be neglected or stamped out. He says, for example, in 1 Corinthians 14, 29, two or three prophets should speak during the course of a meeting, and the other should weigh carefully what it is said, evaluate, is this really what God's doing? And again, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything, hold on to the good, avoid every kind of evil. Don't feel as though that you want to Assume that anything that somebody says, if somebody steps up and says, I think God's saying this, don't buy it right away. Check it out according to Scripture. Be certain that it conforms to God's Word. Weigh it carefully. Is this something that God is doing? On the other hand, don't say, ah, God couldn't ever communicate to anybody. I, I despise that idea. He says, don't treat that with contempt. Let's handle this in a biblical manner, says the Lord. So this is something about prophecy, and as we're going on to Acts facts, I guess we can summarize this way. Prophecy is a gift from God, a gift that God gives to Christians, allowing them to hear his voice, and then when appropriate, communicate that message to others. Well, Peter is standing up and speaking to the people. He says, in the last days, God has said he's going to pour out his spirit, and there will be prophecy. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, verse 17. Your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And then moving on to verse 19. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Wow! It says there are going to be visible things that are going to be happening, shakings of the very uh, firmament, when God's at work. Let's think about this for a minute. We were just in the book of Joshua before we got to Acts. Do you remember when God was on the move and God had the sun stand still? That's an incredible deal. We come forward to other events thinking of like when Jesus was crucified and at the noonday the whole sky goes black for three hours. Are there things that are amazing that happen when God is moving? The answer is yes, there are. There will be a time in the last, last days when there will be even more expressions of God on the move, where there will be plagues and signs in the heavens and things will happen at the end of all time. And Peter says all of this is expected. All kinds of shakings and movings from God will be expected when God is on the move. That's what he is telling them at this point. Much of Acts, and this is interesting, when it says here concerning signs in verse 19, much of Acts is going to be filled with God breaking into new spiritual territory and then demonstrating his presence with miracles and healings and deliverances from demons and rising from the dead. He says, that shouldn't surprise you. When God is moving, you're going to see unusual things happening. There are going to be things that are miraculous that will take place because God is a miraculous God. And, verse 21, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The greatest wonder of all. You would say, I'd love to see some of those miracles and people rising from the dead and so forth. And then God says, no, no, here, the capstone of it all, the most important miracle that God brings is those who call on the name of the Lord and those who believe in him can be saved. That's where this is leading.
The greatest wonder of all, Jesus has provided salvation to everyone who calls on his name, to Jews and Gentiles, to young and old, even to those who are listening to Peter right at this moment. He says, God has called this out so that you who are calling on him, you who are trusting in him, can be saved. And this power for salvation, would say Peter, is available now. The power to proclaim salvation is available to Peter now. I'm going to note something, and maybe you've already thought of this, but it was just weeks ago in Peter's life that somebody said, you're not one of those followers of Jesus, are you? And with curses, he said, I don't know the man. And now, weeks later, the Spirit of God comes on him, and he stands up before thousands and says, you guys should know this about Jesus, and this is what's going on, and the power for salvation is here now. The power that is in Peter to proclaim this came from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come on him, and he's able to preach this now. We come to the third part of our message. Peter has just begun to give them an explanation. He says, all the signs you're seeing going on around, these miraculous things you're seeing and hearing, these things are the coming of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to tell you more about Jesus now. And he preaches an evangelistic message to the crowd. He gives them a straightforward evangelistic sermon. And we're going to outline a little of what he has to say. The outline of his sermon speaks of Jesus' power and Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection and Jesus' exaltation and Jesus' identity. Let's just note all of this as we go through his sermon. Verse 22, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. He says, you all heard that Jesus did miracles. That was God saying, look at this guy. He is something more than a regular man. He is God's man. In fact, he is the one that God divinely sent in order to do this work. He says, all of these miracles and astonishing things were pointing like signs toward Jesus. If you think of signs, you're driving along the road, and there's a sign that says, you know, State Park this way. And if you follow that sign, you will get to the State Park. If you're, dry, if you're going through life and God's giving signs that says, oh, this is something important, there's a miracle, it's pointing toward Jesus, then you know that your destination is supposed to be to be looking at Jesus. You're supposed to focus in. Now he says more, verse 23. This man, Jesus, was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. This was God's plan. God wanted to bring him to you, and what'd you do? You, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. The Jews and the Romans together killed Jesus by means of crucifixion. But we'll importantly note that even that was God's plan. God designed that Jesus might die for a purpose. Namely, that Jesus might die for you and for me and for those of us who by our sins killed him. Concerning his resurrection, verse 24, But God raised him from the dead freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. He didn't just die, and now this is getting to be really cool. He says, you've all known of people who've died, but Jesus was not only one who died because God planned it that way, but he rose from the dead because God did this. Jesus came alive, and in order to substantiate this, he quotes again from one of their great prophets, namely the one who wrote the Psalms, David. He says, David spoke about this, saying, I saw the Lord always before me, because he's in my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, my tongue rejoices, my body will live in hope, because you will not abandon me to the grave. Now, let's understand. David says, you will not abandon me to the grave. And, Paul, and, uh, and, and, and Peter is going to say here in just a moment, when David died, he went into the grave, and his body decayed. In just a moment, the psalm is going to go on to say, you're not going to let your holy one see decay. Is David talking about himself? No, David's not talking about himself. When I was in Jerusalem, I went to the place that is purportedly the tomb of David. The idea being that David died, and his body went into a grave, and his body decayed. But David was not writing about himself. He was writing about one who would come later, the Messiah, the Holy One, who would die but not decay. Do you all get this? So he, Peter is saying, we should have known this. The Holy One, Jesus, would die, but he wouldn't decay. He would come alive again. All right, then. Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay, you have made known for me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. God raised Jesus 
from the dead, as had been foretold by David. Peter and the apostles, he says, are witnesses of this fact. We'll read on. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died. He was buried. His tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. That would be Jesus. Seeing what was ahead, looking ahead, David spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, verse 31, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are witnesses of the fact. That's cool. He says, it's not just one of us who sees this. All of us, all of us apostles who stand before you now, all of us, listen, church, all of us saw Jesus alive. We are all witnesses of the fact that he was risen from the dead. And then more than that, we come to verse 33 and speak of Jesus' exaltation. Exalted to the right hand of God. That is, Jesus has been lifted up. He's been raised into the heavens. He's at the right hand of God. He, Jesus, has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. God gave the promised Holy Spirit to Jesus. And what did Jesus do? Jesus has poured it out on you, you know, poured out what you now see and hear. In other words, he says, all of the power, all of the happenings that you see, all this has just happened, this is that one Jesus who has just poured out the Holy Spirit onto all of us. More about Jesus' exaltation. David again spoke of this, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. God says, I'm going to take the Lord Jesus, and I'm going to make him king of all kings. I'm going to put him over all things. He is the greatest power of all. And then something about Jesus' identity, and this is the real punchline here in verse 36. Peter sort of leans in and looks at them and says, I've been telling you all this about Jesus, and I'm going to now reveal to you who he was. You had all been waiting for a Messiah to come. You had been told that there's a coming Messiah, one who would be the Christ. You had been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for that Christ. This one I'm telling you about, this one that you killed, he was the Christ. That was his identity. Notice Jesus, or Peter's words in verse 36. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Lord meaning powerful ruler of all, the king of the universe, and Christ meaning the savior of all and the only way of getting to heaven. And so he could lean into them all and say, the one that you killed, he was Lord and Christ. Now, Brandon rightly pointed out to us that having heard this, they were cut to the heart, meaning they were like, wow, what did we do? Can you even imagine? Think of it. If something that you did brought about the death of one that you realized was someone who was intended to be the one you would marry, the one who would be delivering you in some way, the one who would help you in some respect, and you just did this. Do you get this? He says, you all are responsible for having brought about the death of Jesus, the Lord and Christ. That was Peter's message to these people. Jesus is Lord. Will you accept him? Jesus is Savior. Will you receive him? What happens next? We move on to the main outline again, and it says after this evangelistic message, he makes an evangelistic appeal. And what I mean by that is he tells the people, now it's time for you to make a conclusive decision about all of this. Starting here at verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Clearly, the Holy Spirit is beginning to work on their hearts. And I'll tell you that I know it's the Holy Spirit working on them because I think if just days earlier he had rounded up a bunch of Jewish people and says, you all did this wrong thing, and it was all about Jesus, I think there would have been mob violence and they would have done something bad to him. But instead, they all say, I needed this message. What should we do? And then he begins to map out for them some steps of what they should do. Verse 38. Peter replied, repent. Repent. Understand that your self-directed life, the life where you say, I'm in charge, that's been sin, and it's been an affront to God. God has said that he's in charge, and you've made out yourself to be in charge. This is evil. Repent of that and turn away from it. I'm going to tell you something real honestly. Now I'm speaking to you as a pastor would speak to people he loves. I will tell you very, very straightforwardly and honestly. People who say that they want to follow Jesus, 
but they have not started out this life with repentance. Or they say, I'm now going to follow Jesus after having stumbled and fallen from him in some way, but they say, that was just an honest mistake, it was no big deal, I think I'm going to just sort of pick up and go on, nobody should judge me, God accepts me the way I am, and there's not repentance. They do not go far with Christ. There must be repentance. A repentance is a heart that says, I was wrong. I was doing it the wrong way. God was right and I was wrong, and I see it now. And I'm going to acknowledge that and tell that to God, and I'm going to turn from what was wrong, and I'm going to only have him take charge, because I, in my own way, will get this thing messed up. Do you understand this? Peter says you're going to start with repenting. That's the starting point, and that's still true today. There are people in this room, and God has stirred on their hearts and said, you're not with me, you're not right with me, you're not going my way, you haven't been right with me, you need to do this my way, and you might say, well, okay, I'll try a little harder, and we'll take another step forward. But I say, no, 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 that's not, the, that's not what I'm calling you to do. I'm not asking you to try harder, I'm asking you to repent. Acknowledge that this is wrong, and do it in God's way. Acknowledge that this is wrong, repent turn from this and acknowledge before God and even before people. Is everyone listening? Even before people to say, this was wrong. I admit this was wrong. I will repent of what my life was. I will acknowledge that. Peter says, repent. And be baptized in the name of Jesus. Once you've repented, once you've repented and say, this was wrong and I repent of that and I'm going to receive Jesus, he says, go ahead and make this public. I've known of some people who said, well, now I'm going to start going with God, but I don't want others to really know it. Or I don't want to do it too visibly. Or um, I don't know. I think all of us are a little bit concerned about what other people will think. Is that true? We were, we, we were born that way. And that's why, um, I don't know. No, we're not. Well, I mean, we are born that way. Little kids don't care a lot about what other people think. But as we get older, we could think about this more and more. We are more and more concerned for what people think. That's part of why people don't enjoy things like speaking in public, standing up in front of others, because all think I have no idea what you're all thinking. You're probably all thinking, what a terrible speaker. I, I, I'm ashamed. You know, you, we're wondering what other people will think. And so we'll start to do anything to keep from other people thinking weird things of us. God says, after you've repented, go ahead and go all out. And let other people know whether they like it or not that you're going with Jesus. And you can do that publicly through baptism. You can say, I publicly declare that my life is no longer the same life. It now belongs to Jesus. And I'm going to let you all know that and I'm doing this through baptism. It's going to show visibly on the outside what's already happened inside of me. It's going to show that I've died to sin, and I'm going to be buried under the water as if dead. I'm going to come back up again as if brought to life again. The baptism is not what saves you. You understand that. But it is a public expression of what God has done, and God is pleased when you publicly stand up and say, my life is now in Christ, no matter what anybody thinks. Be baptized. Receive forgiveness of sin. I'm still in Peter's words here in verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. That word for isn't so much a word that means now that you are baptized, only now will you receive the forgiveness of your sins. It's a for that means something like because. You're going to repent and be baptized because you have been forgiven for your sins, and this is going to be a demonstration of what God has done for you, and receive that. You are going to gain a forgiveness of sins, and the ongoing guilt that you've had in the past is going to be gone. Sometimes I've had people who say, well, I'm a Christian, and yet they suffer from guilt, and they suffer from powerlessness over sin, and they suffer from something where sin has just got a grip on them like nobody's business, and they feel like they are just slogging along. At times I've had to say to them, let's re-examine, do you really know Christ? The one who has really come to Christ is set free from the guilt of sin. There is a forgiveness from sin. And that burden of sin that had been there for so long falls away. He says, I want you to repent and be baptized and receive that forgiveness of sin and receive the Holy Spirit. Still in verse 38, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. When you turn to Christ for salvation, the Holy Spirit will be poured out on you too. He says, it's not just us who are receiving this great thing right now. This is available to you, says Peter. Peter says, you can join us in this experience of knowing the Holy Spirit in your lives. So you've got a choice. 
Friends, he would say to them all, either you can remain guilty of rejecting Jesus, or you can embrace him as your Savior and receive the blessing of the Holy Spirit. This choice, this promise, is for all of you who are listening to me. Everyone who's listening to Peter has this choice laid before him. Some of them were mo mocking and saying, no, oh, it's a bunch of drunk guys. Some of them were cut to the heart and saying, I need this. There were people of all sorts reacting in all different ways. He says, this choice and the promise I'm giving you about salvation of sin and the filling of the Holy Spirit, this choice, this promise is for you. And then he says, it's not just for you. It's for the next generations after you. It's for your children and their children and their children and their children and people who are far off generationally way beyond you and also for people who are far off geographically in other parts of the world that you've never even heard of. All of the people that are ever going to hear this message, including those in this room, have the same choice and the same promise. This is still available way down to today. So Peter warns and he pleads in verse 40, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. You've got a choice. You can either be condemned by God along with this generation of people that you're living in right now, which is corrupt, or you can repent and give your life to Christ and follow after him. That is your choice. Which will it be? Even today, you and I need to reconsider Peter's plea. What will you decide? What will you do? Will you turn from this corrupt generation and follow Christ or not? How many of them accepted Peter's message? It says, with many other words, verse 40, he pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Verse 41, those who accepted his message. It wasn't everyone. Some of them did, some of them didn't. That's how it always is. Some of them accepted this. How many of them accepted this? You'd say, it'd be great if there were 20 people who got saved. It would be great if there were 40 people who said, I'm going to go with Christ. It's better than that. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. How many of them had there been in this band of believers prior to this? No, how many of them? Chapter 1, it says there was a certain number of them who were involved with prayer and so forth in Jerusalem. Say it again, 120. There had been 120. And now, the Holy Spirit arrives, Peter preaches, and 3,000 are added to their number. That's church growth, I guess. I mean, it's from 120 to 3,120. A lot happened in a hurry. This brings us to an Acts fact. The work of evangelism is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is excited about evangelism. The Holy Spirit of God is the one who empowers evangelism. Things happen when the Holy Spirit is at work. The work of evangelism is the work of the Holy Spirit. Those who have the Holy Spirit have a desire to see people saved. Wasn't that Peter's concern? He immediately gets the Holy Spirit, and he doesn't say, Woo, you should experience all of what I am feeling right now. That's not what he says. He doesn't say, wow, you know, we're just so enthralled with our fellowship with each other. Why don't you people all go away, and we're going to just have more sweet fellowship with each other. That's not what he's saying. The first concern he has is, all you people need to be saved. That's the Holy Spirit's prime thing that he does. If somebody says, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm filled with spirit, but I don't have a lot of concern for people who are unsaved. I have questions in my mind. The Holy Spirit of God moves us to be concerned about the salvation of souls. Those who see, let's see again, those who have the Holy Spirit have a desire to see people saved, and when sharing about Christ, they know that success will not come from themselves, but from the Holy Spirit. Oh, man, I was with our youth on this past Friday evening. I suppose there were about 40 kids there. And that was what we were covering. We are going through some teaching about evangelism, and I was making as clear as I possibly could. Really, the book was doing this, the book we were covering. I was just adding my own two cents. It was saying, your job is to be witnesses. Your job is to say, this is what Christ has done. The one who's going to really do the work, the one who's going to really bring the conviction, the one who's going to really save somebody is, it's the, it's the Lord. It's the Spirit of God. He's the one that does this work. And there were all kinds of examples to this about I mean, one example of the illustration was if you were taking some college class, maybe it was a, you know, an architecture class and you were in your first year, and the professor says, okay, I'd like you to build the seven-story building and it's going to cost millions and I'd like you to do that and uh, take care of all that. You'd say, I couldn't do that. But if on the other hand he said, I'll tell you how it's going to be. We need the seven-story building or whatever and I've already got all the financing here and I'm effectively going to do the drawing and I'd like you to come and help me and so on. You'd say, that'd be cool. Is that right? You feel like you could do it if all the things were all lined up and the power was there and the money was there and the expertise was there. Well, the fact is, that's what God's saying to you and me. He's saying, the Holy Spirit's going to do the work. Your job, Christian, 
is to say the words of witness. This is what Jesus did in my life. This is what this means. Yes, yeah, some will mock that, some will reject that. They did that to Peter. But others are going to be saved because it's the Spirit of God. Those who really know the Lord and have the Spirit working in them care about people being saved, and they know that the power for salvation comes through the Holy Spirit. We get to the last part of our message, a Spirit-filled fellowship. At the end of chapter 2, we have a portrait of a Spirit-filled church. You see, now there's 3,120 people in the church, and those 3,120 people, everybody listen, they're filled with the Spirit of God. And so... There's something that this church looks like, the early church looks like something that is really wonderful and beautiful. And we get a little picture, a little snapshot of this at the end of the chapter. And it teaches us something about what a spirit-filled church like ought to look like in any generation. It doesn't have a man-centered spirit. It's not people all saying, well, this is what I want, no, this is what I want, let's do it this other way. It's people being filled with the spirit of God and doing things God's way. What does this look like? I've got a little list of the number of things that are true about such a church. Number one, they're obedient to the good word of God. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That is, they have a hunger to know what the apostles taught, to learn it, and to obey it. That's the first item listed in this description. If I want to know what the apostles taught, the way I would know that is through the word of God, through the Bible. I would want to have a hunger for such teaching and then obey it. A Bible-believing church, a Spirit-filled church, a church where the Spirit of God is at work, is one that would say, we want to obey the Word of God. If the Word of God says something, let's line up under that and obey what it says. That would be, you know, one of the things that shows me when the Spirit of God is at work is if I'm in a group of people and we're studying through the Bible, and then one of them says, ah, that's what that means. Okay, that hasn't been what my life has been up until now. But starting today, that's going to be different. I'm changing that because I'm going to obey God's word. That doesn't happen in people's flesh because people don't want to be told what to do. It happens when the Spirit of God is at work and they say, I want to obey that because that's what God's word says. That's a spirit-filled church. A second thing, they were devoted to the fellowship, it says in verse 42. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. And I want to tell you something about this. This is kind of crazy. I already told you 3,000 people were added. Were those 3,000 people friends of one another? Not originally. They came from all different countries. They didn't even all speak the same language, right? And yet, because they were filled with the Spirit, they were devoted to fellowship with each other. They said, the Spirit of God is a spirit that wants us to be close in communion with each other and close fellowship with each other, and we're going to prioritize that with each other. They pursued love for each other. They opened their homes to one another. They prioritized this. The person who's growing in the Holy Spirit of God says, I'm going to prioritize reaching out to other Christians, Christians that are like me, and Christians that are way different. They speak other languages. They come from other age groups. They do whatever. I want to know them. I want to be close to them. I tell you, I notice when somebody starts having the Spirit of God move on him, and he says, in the past, I thought getting, other, getting together with other Christians, maybe uh, for hope group in the home, studying the Bible, whatever, I could sort of take it or leave it or whatever. They say, wow, this is cool. This is, cool. This is the greatest. I want to be there. I'm going to schedule for this. I'm going to push aside all the other things, and uh, you know, I'm going to not fill my life with everything, other little thing. I'm going to prioritize fellowship with other believers, both in stated times when numbers of them get together and in times that are more informal where I'm going to just invite another family over to our home and we're going to have this fellowship with one another. All of that, both of that. A church that seeks to build that fellowship is a spirit-filled church. They were also devoted to prayer, it says in verse 42. The Holy Spirit engenders communication with God and the spirit-filled church prays. It seeks opportunity to pray with one another. They find that God often answers prayer. It's known as a people that pray. When a spirit-filled church says, we have a specific need for prayer and we're going to meet at such and such a time and location, we don't find two or three who are the friends of the pastor getting together. We instead find the church saying, this is God's work. We're going to pray. When a group of people, and it has nothing maybe even to do with a specific stated meeting, but 
they're coming together, some ladies are meeting together, they're having lunch together, it might be at a restaurant, might be in the home, might be any place. They say, well, we're here together. You know what we need to do? We need to pray. Somebody says, I've got a problem, calls up another one and says, I'm really struggling with this thing. And the other one says, well, I know what we need to do. We need to pray. We're saying, this is a group of people who are being prompted by the Holy Spirit to pray. That is a mark of a Spirit-filled church. They're often witnessing God's power, verse 43. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were being done by the apostles. You see, they were living a life of obedience and fellowship and prayer, and then the church was beginning to see wonders such that they could say, that could only be the power of God. They expected God to be a great God, and he proved that he was. There have been time and again when I've seen the people in our church have prayed, and we've said, this is beyond our capacity to see this worked out. It may be an area of somebody's physical healing. It may be an area of somebody's economic need. It may be an area of some other kind of thing, maybe even a need for one person to be forgiving another, something that, that may be the most miraculous of all, all of these things. And you return it to prayer, and then you see, look what God did. That could only be God. There's these answers to prayer that are miracles. They were seeing that often. It was a spirit-filled church. And they cared for one another's needs. Verse 44, all the believers were together, had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Those who had more were sharing with those who had less. Let me explain this to you. These 3,000 people had come from everywhere, all around the empire. And now they're there. They've just gotten saved. Listen, church, they needed to be built up in the faith. They needed somebody to train them. Did these people have homes to stay in? No, I think they had arrived there and they'd stayed temporarily in maybe some places that they had rented or something else, but they'd brought just so much funds and then they were going to go home again. And they said, I'm going to stay on for another six months and get built up in the faith so I can take this message to someone else, right? Who are they going to stay with? Well, yeah, they're going to stay with the 120. We're going to house 3,000. <laughs> okay. And some of them had more means. Some of them were wealthier. And they said, well, brother, I know you were only able to stay for the weekend, but why don't you stay longer? And I'll pay for that. And they said, we don't all need to individually all buy a, you know, a lawnmower and a dishwasher or whatever. I'll buy one and we'll share it with you. Do you get where I'm going with this thing? They said, we are going to share with one another in these circumstances. They gave housing, they gave food, they gave all kinds of things. Later on, and this is interesting to me, see the church in Jerusalem ends up being supposedly burdened with caring for people who had all of you who come from out of town, and they did care for them. And then those people went all back to wherever they came from, and they started churches. And a couple of decades later, through prophecy again, the Spirit of God said, there's going to be a famine in Jerusalem, and the people of Jerusalem are going to be hard hit, and the believers in Jerusalem are going to have need. And you know what all those churches who have now started from all those scattered people did? They collected funds, and they brought it back to the church of Jerusalem that had so generously cared for folks at the beginning. Isn't that interesting? That's how God's economy works. In God's economy, there's always sufficient, although this one seems to lack, and this one has a little more, and they say, we're going to look out for one another and get through this thing. And then what happens is a little later on, the one who was lacking has more, and the one who had more had, is lacking, and then it comes the other direction. That's what happened here. That's a sign of a spirit-filled church. Living a life of worship. Verse 46. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. That is to say, they met in the temple for worship and for teaching. The apostles did things there with them. And then they met in homes for communion and meals. It was all sort of merged together where they'd say, let's have a dinner together, and then we'll have communion together. They praised God in both of these settings. The people around them, I think, were impressed by this joy. There was uninhibited worship in public, uninhibited worship in homes, around the dinner table and things like this. They were a worshiping group of people in large settings and small settings, both. And they prioritized evangelism, verse 47. Praising God, enjoying all the favor of the people. We already heard about that. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Here's a quote from someone. Those first Jerusalem Christians were not so preoccupied with learning and sharing with each other and worshiping that they forgot about witnessing. 
For the Holy Spirit is a missionary spirit who created a missionary church that is one that wants to spread this news about Christ. They were serious about reaching out to others, and we're going to see that throughout the whole book of Acts. There will be some miracle, and they don't all say, wow, a miracle, isn't that great? Let's They're saying, no, no, that miracle only exists so that I can tell you about the one behind the miracle, and that is Jesus. The concern throughout the book of Acts is a witnessing concern. The power they have to witness came from the Holy Spirit. It came from God, and they noticed that. Even in verse 47, it doesn't say, and they witnessed so much that lots of people were added. It instead says, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. That was God's work. When one of these components, and I've got a list of such components, obedience to God's word, or devoted to fellowship, or devoted to prayer, or witnessing the power of God, or caring for one another, or living a life of worship, or prioritizing evangelism. If one of these things is missing, then we're not functioning as a spirit-filled church should, because this is in the portrait of spirit-filled churches. Our last Acts fact, the Holy Spirit is not of secondary importance in the life of a church. Some people may say, you don't want to focus too much on the Holy Spirit. You know, people get into controversies with each other about the Holy Spirit. Let's just focus on the main things. And I would say, the Holy Spirit is one of the main things. Not that he is a thing, but you understand what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit is not of secondary importance in the life of a church. Instead, every desirable aspect of a church, from worship to fellowship to evangelism, is dependent on the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And that brings us through chapter 2, in the book of Acts, we have but 26 chapters to go. We're off to a good start here. I am looking forward to being able to do more of this with you when we meet together again. Will you stand with me right now? We're going to all.